Story eight of A Mirror of Shalott by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story eight Father Martin's Tale. The Father Rector announced to us one day at dinner that a friend of his from England had called upon him a day or two before, and that he had asked him to supper that evening. There is a story I heard him tell, he said, some years ago, that I think he would contribute if you cared to ask him, Monsignor. It is remarkable. I remember thinking so. Tonight? said Monsignor. Yes, he is coming tonight. That will do very well, said the other. We have no story for tonight. Father Martin appeared at supper, a grey-haired old man with a face like a mouse and large brown eyes that were generally cast down. He had a way at table of holding his hands together with his elbows at his side that bore out the impression of his face. He looked up deprecatingly and gave a little nervous laugh as Monsignor put his request. It is a long time since I have told it, Monsignor, he said. That is all the more reason for telling it again, said the other priest with his sharp geniality, or it may be lost to humanity. And it has met with incredulity, said the old man it will not meet with it here then remarked monsignor we have been practising ourselves in the art of believing another act of faith will do us no harm we explained the circumstances father martin looked round and i could see that he was pleased very well monsignor he said i will do my best to make it easy when we had reached the room upstairs the old priest was put into the armchair in the centre drawn back a little so that all might see him he refused tobacco propped his chin on his two hands looked more than ever like a venerable mouse and began his story i sat at the end of the semicircle near the fire and watched him as he talked i regret i have not heard the other tales he said it would encourage me in my own but perhaps it is better so i have told this so often that i can only tell it in one way and you must forgive me gentlemen if my way is not yours about twenty years ago i had charge of a mission in lancashire some fourteen miles from blackburn among the hills the name of the place is monkswell it was a little village then but i think it is a town now in those days there was only one street of perhaps a dozen houses on each side my little church stood at the head of the street with the presbytery beside it the house had a garden at the back with a path running through it to the gate and beyond the gate was a path leading on to the moor nearly all the village was catholic and had always been so and i had perhaps a hundred more of my folk scattered about the moor their occupation was weaving that was before the coal was found at monkswell now they have a great church there with a parish of over a thousand of course i knew all my people well enough they are wonderful folk these lancashire folk i could tell you a score of tales of their devotion and faith there was one woman that i could make nothing of she lived with her two brothers in a little cottage a couple of miles away from monkswell and the three kept themselves by weaving the two men were fine lads regular at their religious duties and at mass every sunday but the woman would not come near the church i went to her again and again and before every easter but it was of no use she would not even tell me why she would not come but i knew the reason the poor creature had been ruined in Blackburn, and could not hold up her head again. Her brothers took her back, and she had lived with them for ten years, and never once during that time, so far as I knew, had she set foot outside her little place. She could not bear to be seen, you see. The little pointed face looked very tender and compassionate now, and the brown beady eyes ran round the circle deprecatingly well it was one sunday in january that alfred told me that his sister was unwell it seemed to be nothing serious he said and of course he promised to let me know if she should become worse but i made up my mind that i would go in any case during that week and see if sickness had softened her at all alfred told me too that another brother of his patrick on whom let it be remembered and he held up an admonitory hand i had never set eyes was coming up to them on the next day from london for a week's holiday he promised he would bring him to see me later on in the week there was a fall of snow that afternoon not very deep and another next day and i thought i would put off my walk across the hills until it melted unless i heard that sarah was worse 
it was on the wednesday evening about six o'clock that i was sent for i was sitting in my study on the ground floor with the curtains drawn when i heard the garden gate open and close and i ran out into the hall just as the knock came at the back door i knew that it was unlikely that any should come at that hour and in such weather except for a sick call and i opened the door almost before the knocking had ended the candle was blown out by the draught but i knew alfred's voice at once she is worse father he said for god's sake come at once i think she wishes for the sacraments i'm going on for the doctor i knew by his voice that it was serious though i could not see his face i could only see his figure against the snow outside and before i could say more than that i would come at once he was gone again and i heard the garden door open and shut he was gone down to the doctor's house i knew a mile further down the valley i shut the hall door without bolting it and went to the kitchen and told my housekeeper to grease my boots well and set them in my room with my cloak and hat and muffler and my lantern i told her i had had a sick call and did not know when i should be back she had better put the pot on the fire and i would help myself when i came home then i ran into the church through the sacristy to fetch the holy oils and the blessed sacrament when i came back i noticed that one of the strings of the purse that held the picks was frayed and i set it down on the table to knot it properly then again i heard the garden gate open and shut the priest lifted his eyes and looked round again there was something odd in his look gentlemen we are getting near the point of the story i will ask you to listen very carefully and to give me your conclusions afterwards i am relating to you only events as they happened historically i give you my word as to their truth there was a murmur of assent well then he went on at first i supposed it was alfred come back again for some reason i put down the string and went to the door without a light as i reached the threshold there came a knocking i turned the handle and a gust of wind burst in as it had done five minutes before there was a figure standing there muffled up as the other had been what is it i said i'm just coming is it you alfred no father said a voice the man was on the steps a yard from me i came to say that sarah was better and does not wish for the sacraments of course i was startled at that why who are you i said are you patrick yes father said the man i am patrick i cannot describe his voice but it was not extraordinary in any way it was a little muffled i supposed he had a comforter over his mouth i could not see his face at all i could not even see if he was stout or thin the wind blew about his cloak so much as i hesitated the door from the kitchen behind me was flung open and i heard a very much frightened voice calling who's that father said hannah i turned round it is patrick oldroyd i said he has come from his sister i could see the woman standing in the light from the kitchen door she had her hands out before her as if she were frightened at something go out of the draught i said she went back at that but she did not close the door and i knew she was listening to every word come in patrick i said turning round again i could see he had moved down a step and was standing on the gravel now he came up again then and i stood aside to let him go past me into my study but he stopped at the door still i could not see his face it was dark in the hall you remember no father he said i cannot wait i must go after alfred i put out my hand toward him but he slipped past me quickly and was out again on the gravel before i could speak nonsense i said she will be none the worse for a doctor and if you will wait a minute i will come with you you are not wanted he said rather offensively i thought i tell you she is better father she will not see you i was a little angry at that i was not accustomed to be spoken to in that way that is all very well i said but i shall come for all that and if you do not wish to walk with me i will walk alone he was turning to go but he faced me again then do not come father he said come to-morrow i tell you she will not see you you know what sarah is i know very well i said she is out of grace and i know what will be the end of her if i do not come i tell you i am coming patrick oldroyd so you can do as you please i shut the door and went back into my room and as i went the garden gate opened and shut once more my hands trembled a little as i began to knot the string of the picks 
i supposed then that i had been more angered than i had known the old priest looked round again swiftly and dropped his eyes but i do not now think that it was only anger however you shall hear he had moved himself by now to the very edge of his chair where he sat crouched up with his hands together the listeners were all very quiet i had only begun to knot the string before hannah came in she bobbed at the door when she saw what i was holding and then came forward i could see that she was very much upset by something father she said for the love of god do not go with that man oh i'm ashamed of you hannah i told her what do you mean father she said i am afraid i do not like that man there's something the matter i rose laid the picks down and went to my boots without saying anything father she said again for the love of god do not go i tell you i was frightened when i heard his knock still i said nothing but put on my boots and went to the table where the picks lay and the case of oils she came right up to me and i could see that she was white as death as she stared at me i finished putting on my cloak wrapped the comforter round my neck put on my hat and took up the lantern father she said again i looked her full in the face then as she knelt down hannah i said i am going patrick has gone after his brother it is not patrick she cried after me i tell you father then i shut the door and left her kneeling there it was very dark when i got down the steps and i hadn't gone a yard along the path before i stepped over my knee into a drift of snow it had banked up against a gooseberry bush well i saw that i must go carefully so i stepped back on to the middle of the path and held my lantern low i could see the marks of the two men plain enough it was a path that i had made broad on purpose so that i could walk up and down to say my office without thinking much of where i stepped there was one track on this side and one on that have you ever noticed gentlemen that a man in snow will nearly always go back over his own traces in preference to anyone else's well that is so and it was so in this case when i got to the garden gate i saw that alfred had turned off to the right on his way to the doctor his marks were quite plain in the light of the lantern going down the hill but i was astonished to see that the other man had not gone after him as he said he would for there was only one pair of footmarks going down the hill and the other track was plain enough coming and going the man must have gone straight home again i thought now oh one moment father martin said monsignor leaning forward draw the two lines of tracks here he put a pencil and paper into the priest's hands father martin scribbled for a moment or two and then held up the paper so that we could all see it as he explained i understood he had drawn a square for the house a line for the garden wall and through the gap ran four lines marked with arrows two ran to the house and two back as far as the gate at this point one curved sharply round to the right and one straight across the paper beside that which marked the coming i noticed all this said the old priest emphatically because i determined to follow along the double track so far as sarah oldroy's house and i kept the light turned on to it i did not wish to slip into a snowdrift now i was very much puzzled i had been thinking it over of course ever since the man had gone and i could not understand it i must confess that my housekeeper's words had not made it clearer i knew she did not know patrick he had never been home since she had come to me i was surprised too at his behaviour for i knew from his brother that he was a good catholic and well you understand gentlemen it was very puzzling but hannah was irish and i knew they had strange fancies sometimes then there was something else which i had better mention before i go any further although i had not been frightened when the man came yet when hannah had said that she was frightened i knew what she meant it had seemed to me natural that she should be frightened i can say no more than that he threw out his hands deprecatingly and then folded them again sedately on his hunched knees well i set out across the moor following carefully in the double track of of the man who called himself patrick i could see alfred's single track a yard to my right sometimes the tracks crossed i had no time to look about me much but i saw now and again the slopes to the north and once when i turned i saw the lights of the village behind me perhaps a quarter of a mile away 
then i went on again and i wondered as i went i will tell you one thing that crossed my mind gentlemen i did wonder whether hannah had not been right and if this was patrick after all i thought it possible though i must say i thought it very unlikely that it might be some enemy of sarah's some one she had offended an infidel perhaps but who wished her to die without the sacraments that she wanted i thought that but i never dreamt of of what i thought afterwards and think now he looked round again clasped his hands more tightly and went on it was very rough going and as i climbed up at last on to the little shoulder of hill that was the horizon from my house i stopped to get my breath and turned round again to look behind me i could see my house lights at the end of the village and the church beside it and i wondered that i could see the lights so plainly then i understood that hannah must be in my study and that she had drawn the blind up to watch my lantern going across the snow i am ashamed to tell you gentlemen that that cheered me a little i do not quite know why but i must confess that i was uncomfortable i know that i should not have been carrying what i did and on such an errand but i was uneasy it seemed very lonely out there and the white sheets of snow made it worse i do not think that i should have minded the dark so much there was not much wind and everything was very quiet i could just hear the stream running down in the valley behind me the clouds had gone and there was a clear night of stars overhead the old priest stopped his lips worked a little as i had seen them before two or three times during his story then he sighed looked at us and went on now gentlemen i entreat you to believe me this is what happened next you remember that this point at which i stopped to take breath was the horizon from my house notice that well i turned round and lowered my lantern again to look at the tracks and the yard in front of me they ceased they ceased he paused again and there was not a sound from the circle they ceased gentlemen i swear it to you and i cannot describe what i felt at first i thought it was a mistake that he had left a yard or two that the snow was frozen it was not so there a yard to the right were alfred's tracks perfectly distinct with the toes pointing the way from which i had come there was no confusion no hard or broken ground there was just the soft surface of the snow the trampled path of of the man's footsteps and mine and alfred's a yard or two away the old man did not look like a mouse now his eyes were large and bright his mouth severe and his hands hung in the air in a petrified gesture if he had leapt he said he did not alight again he passed his hand over his mouth once or twice well gentlemen i confess that i hesitated i looked back at the lights and then on again at the slopes in front and then i was ashamed of myself i did not hesitate long for any place was better than that i went on i dared not run for i think i should have gone mad if i had lost self-control but i walked and not too fast either i put my hand on the picks as it lay on my breast but i dared not turn my head to right or left i just stared at alfred's tracks in front of me and trod in them well gentlemen i did run the last hundred yards the door of the oldroyd's cottage was open and they were looking out for me and i gave sarah the last sacraments and heard her confession she died before morning and i have one confession to make myself i did not go home that night they were very courteous to me when i told them the story and made out that they did not wish me to leave their sister so the doctor and alfred walked back over the moor together to tell hannah i should not be back and that all was well with me there gentlemen and patrick said a voice patrick of course had not been out that night end of story eight